I have been waiting for this moment for a long time, and I'm very happy to see you all here to join to this session. And I have a pleasure of inviting and introducing Professor Kari Smith to give the next keynote presentation. Kari Smith ha serves as a professor in the program for teacher education at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Her main research fields are teacher education, professional development, mentoring novice teachers, and assessment for and off learning. She has also a long experience as a teacher. She has acted as head of teacher education programs abroad as well as at the University of Bergen, Norway. Currently, she is a head of the Norwegian National Research School in Teacher Education. She has published a numerous articles, book chapters, books. She has, has also been active in early, pre pre previously as a coordinator for the SIG one assessment and evaluation and the coordinator for 611 teaching and teacher education. She has given talks in Australia, New Zealand, China, US, Dubai, and so on. And now we have an honor to have her here in the early conference in Tampere. The title of this presentation I guess she might call us to move beyond the rhetoric of research-based teacher education. Varsos Nilkari. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm truly honored to give a keynote at early. I have to tell you my first early conference, I'm ashamed to say nearly, was the fourth early conference in 1991, also in Finland, in Turku. At that time, psychometric research was strong in early, it still is. And as regards assessment, measurable data were most important. It was before the revolutionary paper by Black and Williams a, a, a assessment in classroom learning. And I had not yet done my PhD. And I dared give a paper called Teachers Action Research on the use of self-assessment in teaching English as a foreign language. In Norway, you, we say when you do something which is normatively and socially inappropriate, it is like cursing in the church. Well, in 1991, talking about action research and self-assessment to the early community felt like cursing in the church. Today, hopefully, things have changed. Uh, first of all, let me explain here at the bottom, let me explain uh, uh, the abbreviations you see here. Teacher Educator is clear. SPTE, as you will see further on in the presentation, is school-based teacher educators. And I'll come back to that quite a lot. And H-E-I-B-T-E, higher education institution-based teacher educators. It's important to keep that in mind. Uh, this is my personal trajectory into a, a, a teaching, or into teacher education. I started as a teacher, was a teacher for 20 years. Uh, then I became a school-based teacher educator. That means I uh, had students observing and teaching in my classes in school, so I became a mentor 
school-based teacher educator. Then I was asked to teach the methodology course of uh, uh, teaching English to primary school and later on to secondary school at the university. So I became a higher education institution-based teacher educator. But I still taught, so I had that hybrid position for about 10 years. Then I became a teacher educator and much more heavily involved with research. And today, teacher educator doing research and also being the head of or the leader of various programs. Um, I am probably, for those of you who attended Manfred's excellent keynote yesterday, I am probably one of these in-between people that he talked about. Uh, Murray and Mail, they have a paper from 2005, and also Amanda Berry's work from 2007, self-study on her own uh, uh, trajectory into teacher education. I think these provide good descriptions of how it is to move from being a teacher to becoming a teacher educator. It is not a very easy journey to undertake. The framework of my presentation will be as follows. Uh, I will talk and try to define how I see de uh, teacher education, to define it. Then I'll talk a bit about who are the teacher educators. Manfred mentioned it yesterday. I'll go more deeply into it, and maybe to have a different approach to it. And then I'll talk about why do we need, why do we talk about a research-based teacher education? What do policy papers say, and what does research say? I'll talk about consuming research as well as producing research. And then I'll conclude by discussing developing a culture of research in teacher education. Uh, throughout my talk, I'll have the question, research-based teacher education, mainly in the rhetoric, at the back of my mind all the time. And I hope that this is a question that also you will be reminded of and that you might think of your own context as I'm talking. And I'm looking forward to your questions at the end. Uh, teacher education, definition of teacher education. How do we define it? Here I'd like to share a, a, a look at what the, the Irish Teaching Council decided in 2011 as the definition of teacher education. It's formal and informal educational and development activities in which teachers engage as li lifelong learners during their teaching career. And they talked about the three I's, initial, induction, and in-service teacher education. I would, however, claim that there's a pre-initial phase to teacher education. And that means that most uh, 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 teacher education students, they have observed at least about 13,000 hours of teaching before they uh, become teacher educators. If you observe something 13,000 times, you are an expert, at least talking about it. Then you have the initial teacher education, where I think that the main uh, purpose is to acquire the basic teacher knowledge. It's a key into the profession. Then I think we should also low for in the teaching profession so to have a clear phase of induction. I would like to see it mentored where they are qualifying as professionals, and that has to be on-job learning. And then you have the professional development activities. Okay, unlike what the Irish Teaching Council and many other people, they talk about lifelong learners as teachers. I prefer to have the word a career-long education 
I hope that when I retire, I can do other things and learn other things without dealing with teacher education only. So instead of the lifelong learning as a teacher and teacher educator, I'm in favor of lifelong learning, but not necessarily the same topic. But as long as you have the career as a teacher, I think you should engage in career-long learning as a teacher. In Ireland, they have also done, you know, they have changed the three eyes, and now they are talking about innovation, integration, and improvement. And that is interesting because it means that they are moving their views into the 21st century skills, I think, to a larger extent. What is evident in this model, though, is that professional development is shared by the institution, a high academic institution, as well as by the practice field. And the question is then, where does the government and the governing powers come into play with regard to professional development of teachers? In my opinion, it is their responsibility, I'm talking about the governing powers, to make sure that professional development is taking place. That is, that there are enough resources in terms of time, money, and facilities. However, also to keep in mind, and here I'm referring to Chris Day, that professional development is not something that can be imposed on a person. Then it becomes just an outer cosmetic change. I think that professional development is an inner process that requires the professional practitioner to have an ownership of the process. That the changes are not only in the behavior, but they are based in the attitudes and beliefs, and not least in knowledge. And then the question is, how do they get this knowledge? Having defined teacher education as a career-long education, I'd like to briefly discuss the issue of who the teacher educators are. In the university, higher education and institutions, there are cross-disciplinary involvement in many teacher education programs, including those that I'm familiar with. However, this is not always an accepted view. I would say that subject experts, and Manfred talked about it a bit yesterday, who teach content knowledge to teachers to be, are to my mind, teacher educators alongside the methodologists and the pedagogues. The question is, do they see themselves as that? And at school, it is first and foremost the school mentor who is the teacher educator. However, I think the whole school has to be involved in the education of pre-service and in-service novice teachers. So in brief, I think there are school-based as well as higher education institution-based teacher educators. And that is a point to keep in mind when discussing research-based teacher education. And I think we should not only talk about higher institution-based teacher educators, but also school-based teacher educators. I'll take this a bit further, because we are currently witnessing a practice turn in teacher education. The practical component of initial teacher education is extended in many contexts. And in some contexts, the majority, if not all, of the preparation of teaching takes place in school. And I think uh, uh, England is a country where more and more of teaching takes place in school on job. This leads to a growing importance of school-based teacher educators. And as their role as teacher educators become more central, their professional knowledge needs to be expanded. They are not only expected to teach children, 
but to teach those who are going to teach children. To open up their tested knowledge and let the student teachers and novice teachers get access to that knowledge. And I see, think we know too little about the kind of knowledge that school-based teacher educators need to have in order to do the job as teacher educators, in addition to being teachers. So part of developing an infrastructure for the practice turn in teacher education, we have to know more about what it entails to be a school-based teacher educator. By today, we don't know enough. Moreover, we have not succeeded, uh, successfully, I think, succeeded in creating and integrating third spaces. Meeting points between higher education institutions and the practice field, or meeting points between theory and practice. The awareness of the, of the importance of these hybrid spaces is not new. Baba talked about it already in 1990, yet many teacher education programs still face challenges creating third spaces. It is not only a structural problem, I think, perhaps more an attitude problem. Do we recognize do we accept different types of expertise and knowledge, the practical and the more theoretical? And do we open this up so the students can see that, this, that we mutually respect each other's knowledge? We have to create spaces for these meeting places, the third spaces. In European and in Norwegian policy documents, there's a strong argument for developing close partnerships with schools. From my own long and varied experience in teacher education, I find that there are three forms for school and higher education institution collaboration, which can be placed on a continuing from being separated to being cooperative. If we take the first to the far, uh, uh, that would be left for you, uh, uh, the practice schools. Then universities work with practice schools, students are placed in schools during the practicum, and there might be an informative meeting for the school-based teacher educators in the beginning, and maybe a meeting at the end, and a couple of visits by the higher education institutional-based teacher educators. There is very often not much collaboration beyond that. This is, as I can see it, hardly a partnership. A closer form for partnership is found when selected schools and the university have a contracted relationship on mutual rights and responsibilities. Falsi and criteria for assessment of the practicum can, can, for example, be discussed in joint seminars. And there are multiple joint meetings points for professional development purposes, but also for students to engage in dialogues with different kinds of expertise. Here, I think we see good signs of partnerships. In no way, the concept university schools is getting a lot of attention, and various models are practiced. For example, at Oslo and Tromsø universities, and in my own institution, and Genu, where we might have a different model. It is a co in our institute, university, it's a cooperation between uh, the regional authorities the university and the schools. Schools which apply to be a university school is, is carefully selected, and in our case, 
not by us, but by the regional council. The selected schools serve as sites for joint research and development projects. Often defined by the schools, not by us, the teachers in our university schools define the research and development projects. The schools serve as practice schools for student teachers, who also use the schools to collect data for their master thesis. All teachers in these schools have taken at least a 15 uh, 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 mentor education, a 15 ECTS mentor education course. And we have hybrid positions, teacher educators working in schools and in teacher education. This form reflects a true partnership with shared rights and responsibilities. Then I'll go on to talk about research-based teacher education, and I'll discuss a bit why. What do the policy papers say? First, these are selected, very selected uh, policy papers, so it's impossible to mention them all. But OECD, in its very well-known uh, uh, Teachers Meta document, it says that teachers should be involved in identifying competences and standards. I think to do this, they have to be involved in the research in this, uh, defining what are the competences and what are the standards. That is research-based. And also initial teacher education shall ensure that future teachers can do research on the job. So here it's clearly stated. If we go from OECD to the European Commission, what do they say? In 2007, they had a document talking about practitioners and policymakers should be producers of knowledge. That means to actively engage in research. And in 2013, in their document on teacher educators, supporting teacher educators, I think it's called, they say that research can contribute to a deep understanding of education and teacher education. So research is important, according to policymakers. However, these are big words and not always easy to translate into practice. Then if I go on to my own country, Norway, you can see here in a document from 2014 and in another other document from 2017 that research is important. The words are clear. However, little is said about how to develop a research-based teacher education and what does it really entail? What does it mean? If we look a bit at the, the, the uh, 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 research and what does the research say? Again, I apologize for just being capable of showing a very, very limited selection. But I'd like to start with Jean Ruddock's paper from 1985, where she already argues for developing research competence in student teachers, which I think is part of having a research-based teacher education. And I will challenge this notion later on. Seichner suggests that it, it's time to focus our research on teaching and less on teachers. And in other words, maybe moving out of the reflective practice period and into a more policy-driven period. And here I'm using Cochrane Smith's concepts from 2004. In the USA, there's a strong direction of research searching for common factors or core competences in teaching. And I'd like to expand not too much, but a bit on this topic. And maybe also to position myself in this line of research-based teaching to, to be introduced in research-based teacher education program. I 
I think it's an interesting line of research. And it's worthwhile, as I said, having a closer look at the extensive North American research mainly taking place here. The core practices differ from lists of competences, as can be understood by looking at the criteria for core practices suggested by Grossman, Hammersness, and McDonald. There are some questions enough that I'd like to raise when looking at the criteria. Practices that occur with high frequency in teaching. My question is, are these not contextually bound? Are these not related to subject, to culture, to age level? Or shall the definitions be so broad that to a sense they become meaningless? Then we have another one. The practices should apply to different curricula and instructional approaches, maybe also in different cultures. And practices are research-based. What kind of research are we talking about to say that practices should be research-based? These are questions that I think we have to dive into and, and, and discuss. In order, I don't have the answers. I just think that these are questions we have to pose within our own institutions, within our own communities. Practices have the potential to improve student achievement. But what do we define as student achievement? Are we talking about grades and standardized tests for accountability purposes? Or are we talking about achievements related to learning such as self-regulation and strength and self-efficacy? What do we mean by achievement? And is it the same across national borders? The examples of core practices that we have here are, as you can see, central to the daily work of teaching, central to supporting student learning, etc. As, re as regards student learning, let us take my field, assessment. Central to supporting student learning, does a testing loaded context support learning or does a formative assessment approach support learning? There are different understandings, views, perspectives of this. And what are we going to say and what should be in the core practices? There are indeed, I think, things that teachers do in whatever context they teach. They manage a class, they assess learning, they plan lessons, they present material, and I'm also pleased to see that the researchers cl clearly say that core practices are not lists of competences and they relate to principles and theories. And by doing that, they are research-based. From the examples given here, my impression is that core practices carry a broad meaning and can be practiced in different ways in different contexts. I would like to claim, however, that we need to be careful translating from context to context. And then the next question that I would like to pose, does the research inform policy? Sleater looked at four international journals. And it was a review, as you can see, that she did in 2012, published in 2014, I think. And she found that there are three main foci of research presented in teacher education research. And she's talking about initial and uh, in-service teacher education. The other fo uh, focus is teachers, and the fourth focus is on students. So these are the uh, foci that uh, she found. Does this 
research, rather extensive research, inform policymakers? It is difficult to decide, as Lita didn't find an emerging research direction with the purpose of informing policy. The research is mainly small scale, local studies, and this makes it difficult for policymakers to make use of research in forming policies. Seichner has criticized teacher education research on the same point since 2007. So it seems that we do have a problem disseminating our research to policymakers. And since they decide on the structure and to some extent also on the context of teacher education, to what extent can we then say that teacher education is research-based? Finland, which has long experience with research-based teacher education, highly respected and admired and envied. And uh, uh, Kropfos and her long list of uh, uh, co-authors, they have stated explicit criteria for the concept. The study program is structured according to a systematic analysis of education. All teaching is based on research. Activities are organized in such a way that students can practice argumentation, etc. You can read. And the students learn formal research skills during their studies. To watch, this is a construct, I say, of, of research based teacher education I find useful. And I will discuss some of the points in the following because I'm not quite sure that this happens in teacher education programs. If we start talking, first of all, about consumers, because in Crockford's def definition, and I and her co-authors, uh, uh, students and teachers are both consumers and researchers and, and producers of research. And I certainly believe that there should be both. That should be one of our aims. And here I'll, I'll move into a, a teacher educators first. And to see, is it really so? Are the consumers and are the producers of research? I'd like to some, spend some time presenting InfoTED the International Forum for Teacher Educator Development, and the kind of research we are doing there. And just to briefly show you the website where you can learn much more about InfoTED. InfoTED was established in 2013 at ARA, so this is the website. Uh, and I'm not going to develop, but you can see here, you can find blogs, articles, our activities, publications, what we are doing. Uh, so, as I said, it was established in 2013 at ARA. These are the countries involved with InfoTED. And our mission is to be consumers as well as producers of research and to influence European policy makers. We meet twice a year and in between and at conferences. Some of my colleagues in InfoTED are hopefully sitting here. And, and, and uh, uh, we have already uh, uh, succeeded in having some uh, uh, publications about teacher educators that are the, one of them I'd like to share with you. We had a survey where we collected data from six countries and we asked the following questions. How do teacher educators describe their professional learning opportunities and what are their most important learning needs? 
We all collect the data, whereas the authors of this article come from England, Israel, and uh, Ireland. Janioski, Guberman, and McPhail. What is interesting is that when we ask them to identify themselves, then we can see that identifying themselves as researchers is very, very low. The paper is published in the European Journal of Teacher Education, so you can find the reference there. They are first and foremost teacher educators. And if we go on though, then you see the surprise, because they don't identify themselves as researchers, but you can see that they are highly confident in their capability of conducting research. And they are also highly confident in saying that they are involved with doing research. So it's interesting, and currently we are following up this quantitative data with the qualitative data to see what is happening. So when we asked about areas for professional learning, this claim as third, and a good third, that they want to learn more about research skills. So the initial observations here is that all of teacher educators don't identify themselves as researchers. Their attitudes, you can see, towards research is very positive. And they are very confident in their ability to conduct and to engage in research. But they don't identify as researchers. Interesting, and we would like to continue developing that line of research to learn more about it. Then I'm developing the thing of consuming teacher uh, research and teacher education a bit more. Uh, then when we are talking about study programs, are they based on research? Do we plan our study programs in teacher education or research? Or do we base it on policy requirements and we pay lip service to the policy requirements because we don't have any other choice? Or is it on traditions? This is the way we have done it. To what extent do we base it on research? In a large Canadian study uh, 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 from the University of Concordia, Venkates, Koto, and Raba, they looked at how students perceived course effectiveness, for example, and how this can be linked to perceptions of instructional methods employed by teachers. They had collected data from more than 14,000 students. And they are one of the findings that they found there, which I think is surprising that good lectures is something that students highly appreciate. And that group work, male students are more opposed to than female students. They also prefer ICT, blended learning. And the question is to what extent do we use this kind of research when we are planning our programs? Then I'd like to go on and say, do what extent do we design our own practice around complex understanding of what practice really is? Uh, uh, do we do some kind of research on our own practice, self-studies, action research? To what extent do we do that in order to improve our own practice? Design studies? intervention studies in order to do that. Munt, and then the last one is a reading list. Are we consumers of research also in terms of exposing our students to recent research? Uh, Munt and Rogner from Norway in 2015 claim that Norwegian teacher education programs have research on the reading list. However, uh, uh, that is a rather big stu uh, uh, study. My own two smaller projects, they contradict this though. 
In a comprehensive evaluation of a teacher education program in Norway, we found that there were most, no, mostly Norwegian references, very few international references, and there were more textbooks than updated research uh, uh, articles on the, re on the students' reading lists. In another small project in preparation for this talk, I examined the, teaching, uh, the reading list of 10 Norwegian teacher education programs, and I found the same. Norwegian textbooks, literature, not always research related. That was dominant. And especially in teacher education for primary school, it was slightly better in teacher education for secondary school. Then I'm moving on to producing research. And in relation to the production of research in teacher education, there are three main issues I'd like to discuss a bit further. The first issue is, who are the researchers? As I see it, the researchers should be teacher educators from higher education, from the schools, and from the students. And here I might disagree with, with uh, 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 Manfred's claim yesterday that teacher's job is to teach and not doing research. I would claim that in order to teach well, you have to do some kind of research. And I would also claim that they have to be consumers as well as producers of research. The second question relates to what kind of research should be uh, produced in teacher education. I think there's a need for both theoretical and practice-oriented research. Though I think the latter is a, a more suitable for practitioner research. And teacher educators, both types, as well as students, are all practitioners one way or the other. Therefore, research and development projects aiming practice, uh, examining practices in school and in teacher education with the purpose of improving education at all levels are well suited. Again, I would argue in favor of action research, self-studies and design studies, intervention studies. These are all practice-oriented approaches. I think all actors should be competent to conduct. So we are talking about practice-oriented research literacy. The third question asks about the relevance of research that is produced in teacher education. I think there should be relevance at, three, at, at four levels. The knowledge production level, yes, it has to be knowledge production, and that means there has, it has to be quality assured research. It also has to be relevant to the policy makers to teacher education leaders, programs, and not least to schools. All levels are in need of being informed by research in the joint effort to improve education. Now I intend to share with you just a very brief description of Norwegian content. From this August, we have probably copied Finland to a certain extent, all teacher education will be at the master level, and there will have to be a research-based uh, dissertation. And that means that many of the teacher education institutions in Norway, they uh, uh, needed to apply for accreditation to be accredit accredited to have master programs. And uh, in order to do that, they needed a certain percentage of teacher educators with a PhD degree. And that was a problem for smaller university colleges. But the smaller university colleges have been maybe the core of Norwegian primary teacher education. And today, in order to get a permanent job in teacher education and to be promoted, it relates to the number on quality of your publications, less the teaching. 
So in brief, if you want a career in Norwegian teacher education, you must be what I call a researching uh, teacher educator. Uh, in the same study as I referred to earlier, Munt and Rogne, they found that there's an increasing number of teacher educators with a PhD in Norway. And I will uh, uh, talk about one of the reasons, I think, why this is happening in a short while. However, they have great variations in research opportunities. If you work at a university college, you have less opportunity than if you work at a university. Oh, sorry, that is not what I meant. And uh, uh, NOKUTS, which is Norwegian Quality Assurance uh, 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 Agency, they also found in a very recent report that research is important for a, a teacher educator's own teaching, and teaching is important for research. So they play into each other. However, they also found, and that I'll come back to, that students are not very heavily involved in research activities. In their role as school-based teacher educators, that means teachers who are also uh, mentoring student teachers, these should be expected to consume research, be updated, I think, about recent developments, in all aspects of their pedagogical content knowledge, using Schulman's a, a term yesterday, used also by Manfred. A, a Schulman's term for 86, but also by Manfred. They have, however, also responsibility, I think, for being involved in research, mainly because action research and design studies, I think they are useful personal and school development tools. Then they also have to act as co-researchers in research and development projects. I talked about the university schools that we are developing. I would like to see more as co-researchers and not only to be people that are being researched on. And I think they should also be involved in acting as on-site supervisors for students' research projects. And in order to do that, they have to be research competent. Furthermore, I think it would be easier to have a shared language with students and a higher education institution-based teacher educators if we all talked about what we call research literacy. And then finally, I think it would be a way to uh, operationalize the third spaces that I, I have been talking about. I think uh, 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 we still have a long way to go. Uh, but also things are happening. Uh, um, and I think we should keep that in mind as well. We shouldn't be too negative. And then I'm talking a bit about, do they use, consume research, school-based teacher educators? And here I'm referring to van der Linne and Brock, a study from 2010, where we can see that ambiguity is a word that is repeated in the table that I've taken from their paper. Uh, 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 teachers didn't see how educational research could be translated into the practical uh, classroom teaching. The purpose of educational research was ambiguous for them. Moreover, teach, uh, uh, research papers are often written in a difficult language. Practitioners do not get the meaning of it. It is important to dis disseminate research in different ways to different audiences. And this sometimes contradicts the increasing pressure we have for academic publications in high-impact journals. There is also much descriptive research instead of design or intervention research. That means to try out things that work in practice 
both of which are more concrete and of practical value to practitioners. So if we complain that they do not consume research, to what extent have to have we, should we look at ourselves and see, to, do we disseminate our research sufficiently to the uh, practitioners? And I think that uh, 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 this might contradict the pressure we have, as I said, on publish, publishing in high prestigious journals. Then I move on to the next one, and I'm talking about student as researchers. Here, uh, 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 Jurma, and I apologize for not pronouncing the name, they are Finnish, Jurma, or something like that. Uh, they had a study in 2008 where they asked 113 Finnish students about their experiences with the research-based teacher education. They used an online service to do this. And they found several reasons for students being involved with research. First and foremost, educating teachers, ex teachers executing informed agency in relation to own practice and beliefs. Informed agency. They take control of their own teaching, but the decisions that they make, they do by being informed by research. Also, I think that it's important to empower teachers to become agents of change. And you can only do that when you can criticize and you are knowledgeable about what you criticize. And also, to link between theories and practice. And the findings from the Finnish studies indicate that supervision could have been improved and that the research approach was less salient in the practice teaching. And these are findings worthwhile reflecting on. Supervision could have been improved. Was it because lack of research competence among the supervisors? Or was it more related to a, 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 a lack of supervision skills, lack of the knowledge about the pedagogy of supervision. The article doesn't give an answer to that. Second, the research practice gap that Van der Linn and Bra found in Flanders seems also to be the case in Finland. School-based teacher educators were found to work more intuitively basing their knowledge on experiences and traditions and less on research. Is this because the dissemination of research is not well done well enough? Or do we not reach the, press, uh, uh, the practitioners because we are too concerned with our own publications? Is this the right way to go? Or can we find ways to reach different target audiences? If we go on and we look at students as researchers a bit more, I think it is necessary to empower students in research competence from the very beginning. And this is an example of how it can be done in a five-year teacher education program. That we are talking about in the first year, learning the research tool of observation, and they have assignment and observation. In our programs, they are out in school already in the first semester. So why not, and they are observing teaching, so why not teach them about observation as a research tool? Second year, we could focus on interviewing as a research school. Third year, quantitative methods, developing a survey, writing a research literature. Fourth year, then, they should be ready for a full-fledged methods course which makes a synthesis of what they have been uh, met with before. And that will, in a way, prepare them for doing their master thesis in the fifth year. This is just an approach I think might be useful when we are talking about developing research competence in student teachers. It's 
Uh, I think we should also uh, 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 make sure that, that uh, 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 they are involved with research. And uh, in a course that I developed in a program I taught in Israel, I called the course Teach as Researchers. And uh, there, we, the course uh, uh, instructors, we had our own re action research and how to teach action research to the uh, student teachers. Well, they were all practicing teachers. And what we very re early realized was in full alignment with what Ponte and Beja said in 2007. They can read about action research till the cows come home, but it's only by doing it that you actually learn about it at a sort of conceptual level of what it's really about. But action research made them into consumers as well as producers of research. At the University of Bergen, Marit Ulvik and her colleagues, they are introducing action research in the integrated master program in teacher education. And uh, they have published quite a lot on it. They are certainly in favor of action research for student teachers, but they are not blind to the many challenges like the time constraint, it's one semester, and the fact that the student's research knowledge is limited. And that takes me to the last part of my talk. And here I'm going to talk a bit about developing a culture of research. And uh, um, I am bold enough to use Norway as an example of how it is possible to develop a culture of research for a research-based teacher education. Norway has even been cited, and the initiatives in Norway have been cited by the European Commission later on, where it's, they are talking about two things, and I'll briefly just mention both of them. One is what they call Prakut, uh, which has now further been developed into FINIT. This is a research, Norwegian Research Council research program uh, for teacher educators. And we are looking for research and development activities there, and it's practice-based educational research. I'm fortunate to be involved with some of my colleagues sitting here in one of these projects, which we call Responsive Teaching in Mathematics where we have a quasi-experimental design and we have looking at students learning in terms of self-efficacy, self-regulation and achievements in mathematics, pre and post survey of thousand students. And then we have qualitative analysis of an intervention of seven months with the teachers aiming to look, looking to look for the differences. We don't have the data yet. We will present some of the pilot findings tomorrow in a poster. Another thing is the Norwegian Doctoral School in Teacher Education, NAFOL. And I, I think that is a unique Norwegian initiative that is worthwhile dwelling a bit on. Um, it was first planned to be active from 2010 to 2016. However, it's now prolonged till 2021. Uh, we have currently 100 doctoral students in four cohorts. And four cohorts of 97 have already graduated. For a small country of five million people, these numbers are impressive when we are talk, all talking about teacher educators doing their PhDs, being teacher educators. The purpose of NAFOL is, as we stated in our project description, and more or less also which has been confirmed and wished for by the Ministry and the Research Council, is to develop a research-informed teacher education. But it's not only in the rhetoric, something is being done about it. 
It's also a question that we want to strengthen the quality in all kinds of teacher education. And I'm happy to say that a quarter of our students, 25% of our students, they are preschool teacher educators. So NAFOL is involved with developing a research-based preschool teacher education. To strengthen the professional identity of teacher educators as researchers as well as teachers. And that was for many strains. I was a teacher, I was a teacher educator. You could see 5% only say that they are also researchers. We still have a long way to go. To strengthen research on, in, and with teacher education and school and preschool. So that means it should be relevant for the practice field. And also to enhance the quality of the teaching profession to bring knowledge and competence to the field of practice, and not least, and that is what we are doing, and many of my international colleagues, they are, have been uh, invited and have contributed to NAFOL. We want to establish strong international networks. If we look at the research profile of the Norwegian teach, uh, research schools, that means it's a network of 19 institutions, seven universities, and 12 university colleges. The research profile, as you can see here, they are relevant to the practice field. It is wide on purpose because we don't want to limit it. And in a study carried out by the first head of NAFOL, Professor Anna-Lena Östern, Finnish, by the way, analyzed 140 project abstracts, which were analyzed in terms of their theme and problem formulation. And she found three main discourses, which I think might be interesting. One is a goal-oriented educational discourse. You have the goals stated by the policymakers and the projects they are looking to the extent their goals are achieved or are being put into practice. Another discourse is the building practice, which my Norwegian colleague, Nordic colleagues would know, German colleagues would know more about. And that is they are looking at the moral values, ethical values, aesthetical values, a broader aspect of, the, of being a teacher. And then the third is the democracy uh, uh, discourse, which these days are looking into equity in teacher education and equity in schooling. Uh, so it is a wide uh, uh, area of research that is covered by the NAFOL students. There's much to say about NAFOL, and if anybody is interested in learning more, Please catch me or contact me. However, this is some information about the most important actors in NAFOL, the doctoral students. This picture is from a joint seminar we had last year with Icelandic doctoral students. And we've just had an enriching meeting seminar with doctoral students from the University of Ghent. All our students, they are working in teacher education. They have to have at least two years of experience in schools or in teacher education. They have to be accepted into an academic doctoral program at Norwegian University with usually two supervisors. So we are not a doctoral program. What we are doing is we are giving added support in their doctoral education. They have to have a full funding by own institution for four years, and out of which 25% is work responsibilities. We accept them as cohorts every January, so that means they have 16 seminar, uh, seminars, which are uh, two or three day seminars over the four years four seminars per year for each cohort. It's quite the planning, I can promise you. 
And uh, 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 the publication that we see is now full. The, pr uh, 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 the production, knowledge production, its use. In addition to the dissertation, they, most of them are writing article-based dissertations, so they are publishing in national and international peer-reviewed journals. They are involved with research and development projects and participate in academic and more practice-oriented conferences like this. You have NAFOL uh, alumni from NAFOL here and current NAFOL students here. Go back to their institution as researching teacher educators. And when evaluating NAFL in 2015, we found that teacher education programs are increasingly becoming more research oriented, specifically at the smaller institutions. As one of the deans in the smaller institution said, we finally talk about and invest in research after becoming involved with NAFL. Another initiative that I'm fortunate to be involved with as a scientific advisor is the Horizon 2020 project, EDITA, the European Doctorate in Teacher Education. It is a much smaller project than NAFOL. It has 15 EDITA-funded candidates. And I have been very pleased to see that supervisors as well as EDITA students are here at this conference. EDITA is small, but it impacts teacher education research in a wider perspective in the five partnership institutions. We have Elte Budapest, Hungary, the University of Innsbruck, Austria, the University of Lisbon, Portugal, Masaryk University of the Czech Republic, and the University of Lower Silesia from Poland. EDITA is a European meeting place for international PhD students. And it's a project worthwhile learning from. And we should seek ways of developing it after the project period ends. It is with optimism I look at these initiatives. And I think they can serve as examples of how to develop a culture of research in teacher education so we can go beyond the rhetoric and into the practices. However, it requires long-term investments, time, money, dedication. So, to conclude, in this presentation, I have defined teacher education as I see it, as a career-long education. I have, as I see it, so it's my opinion you've got here, different types of teacher educators, school-based teacher educators, university-based or higher education institution-based teacher educators, content teachers, pedagogues, methodologists. I have claimed that there's a heavy political, mainly, rhetoric for research-based teacher education. And also an in institutional rhetoric when you look at their programs. However, in practice, I think we still have a long way to go. It's very much in the rhetorics. Consuming research, not sufficiently, as I see it, implemented in many programs. And I take the limitation of talking on my own context that I'm familiar with here. Producing research, yes. Lots of declarations. Practice, less. I think this is a critical point, that students seem not to be sufficiently engaged in research. So we do have much in the rhetoric, but I don't think that we have gone deep enough beyond it. However, I think there are positive initiatives for developing a culture of research. Thank you very much. And if you are interested in the references, or contact me, and I'll try to put them on the early website. Okay? They're all there. Thank you.
If you have questions, there is time for questions, and I would be very happy if you just could say who you are. Okay, get up and just say who you are. Hi, my name is Maria Assunção Flores from the University of Minho in Portugal. I would like to thank you, Carrie, for a very insightful and thought-provoking uh, talk, as always. Uh, and I was wondering about this kind of gaps in teacher education when we talk about research. Because in Portugal and in other countries, when we talk about a master degree level in order to become a teacher, um, you tacitly um, understand that it should be a research-based degree. There should be a research dimension. But we also deal with this consecutive model, three plus two, which means that a, a, a two-year master degree level, it's not a long time to develop research. So I wonder if you would, could elaborate a little bit more about these challenges, not only for teacher educators, but especially for student teachers and school-based teacher educators. Because my colleagues and I, we did a study on the reports that student teachers do on their practicum in year two of the master degree in teaching. And we can see that there are some dimensions or some elements of research, but maybe there is much that needs to be done or more to be done in terms of um, the ways in which we look at research or the ways in which we understand research mm -hmm. uh, during practicum, uh, taking into account all the constraints for instance, in my university, we have, we have a framework which includes a, a axiological, conceptual, and methodological dimension. But maybe it's not enough. And I'm, I'm also talking about the different understandings of research from the part of teacher educators themselves. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could comment on these, um, yeah. how can I say, challenges mm -hmm. uh, in research on teacher education. Thank, Thank you. you, Maria. I think one of the challenges is exactly what you said. I think it's the competence of research that many teacher educators have. And, and that means, do they talk research? Do they use the research language in their teaching, in teacher education, from the very beginning? Uh, 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 and that means, do they cite research? Do they cite research properly? That is another thing. Do they give assignments to students to, which are yeah, research inquiry-based? Do they give them tools to do that? But also, as I said in my talk, I think basically you really have to integrate this from the very beginning and not leave it till the two last year if you have a three plus two. I'd like to see a more continuation because I think also when you write your bachelor, uh, uh, some research will be uh, uh, involved in it. So, so I think that research should be a much stronger part of our daily language in teacher education. And uh, the kind of research is, it could be practical, practice-oriented research, as I say, not only. However, that also has to be done well. It should be quality research. And it isn't, uh, I don't accept the fact that, uh, that uh, my people, it's not that it's only reflection. No, I want it to be research. It has to be based on literature review, there has to be a research question, that it has to be systematic data collection. And I think these te school based teacher educators, as well as student teachers, could learn it if we just changed and we implemented it in our program. That is more or less what I thought. Any other questions? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, journey that you help us to take. Especially, I also come from Norway, so I understand very well what you are talking about. One of the things uh, concerning the students is the idea of their professional identities, how they want to see, as you told us about the idea of teacher educators. So this professional identity is very much uh, related with the political discourse, opportunities, and many other kind of possibilities that are there. For example, these new master students who we are creating in Norway 
how will they be adjusted within the system and what will be their role in relation to other actors that are there in the field. Second thing is like uh, when there is no research culture in the school, there is a big pressure of completing practical day-to-day -day life and other things. How will they sustain their motivation and engagement in the long run? Okay. Uh, I think uh, if you allow me, I'd like to address this last question first, okay? Um, I think it is a very good question because we say it again, and this is in the rhetoric, we say that teachers should do research and they have to be involved in research it's, and they have to be school-based teacher educators. However, do we invest in it? Do we say that part of your job, the majority part of your job is teaching, and then you get so and so many percent for becoming a teacher educator? If we involved in, in development projects and in external research projects, are they then given research time or should we expect that they are doing it on their own free time? Th th that is the question. We can't just add on <laughs> to a teacher's responsibility, on and on and on, and without also uh, uh, making sure that they have the resources to do this. And when resources, I'm not talking only about money, I'm talking about time, I think that is the most important thing. And that is maybe one of my main uh, uh, critics that I have of the policymakers. So it's so easy to say that you should have research and based research engagement, uh, research consuming research and so on. When are they going to do that when they are not taken off the teaching load? I talk a bit about, and I call a school-based teacher educators, the mentors, I call them a profession within a profession. And they are main and primary profession that is being teaching of teachers as Manfred, uh, teaching of st or pupils, as Manfred said yesterday. However, if they take on student teachers, they also have a role as school-based teacher educators. What do they know about adult learning? What do they know about the difficult difficulties beyond their own experience of novice teachers, etc.? I think that all school-based teacher educators need to have a mentor education. In Norway, we have we come pretty far with that. Most institutions in Norway, they do have mentor educations, uh, 15 or 30 ECTS. And that means that we are working on developing this kind of knowledge within the school-based teacher education being recognized. So it's a question of time being given to do it as well, resources. The same in personal involvement in a, a, a research. So if, for example, a team of English teachers in a school would like to try out a new way of teaching vocabulary, okay? I was an English teacher. Would like to try out a new way of teaching vocabulary. They have to get the support of the principal to have time to meet, to plan the intervention, to read about it. This has to be planned into their daily uh, weekly schedule and not just added on. So I don't know if I responded to it, but that is exactly what I say. It is so easily to put it in the rhetoric, but do we go deeper into it? I think I'm afraid we don't know. We don't do, not sufficiently. I didn't relate to your first question, but I don't know if this is okay, so we can have more questions. Is this okay? Okay, thank you. Talk. I don't know if people can hear me. Um, I've had the pleasure of following these in initiatives over several years, and, and it's, it's a very amazing work that's being done. And um, the whole politics, in one way, you get two for one. You get uh, better researchers, 
and you get qualified teachers. So, so I think that's... talking about Norwegian initiatives. Amazing. Uh, but I do have one concern, and I'd like to ask you about it. And that is, you are getting now perhaps um, a monopoly of teachers researching their own practices. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about, is there going to then be room for the outside researchers, which, which we've had um, a long tradition for, that you don't only have researchers who are researching their own mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have any reflections on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the type of researchers yeah. Yeah. Um, that the practitioners do, yeah. and the type of research other mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. could do? Thank you very much. Uh, um, I think they have to feed into each other. I think we will be uh, 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 deprived of something if we only looked at practitioners and researchers looking into their own practice. Other research coming from the outside about teaching, about school, about teacher education, I think we need that. That has to feed into the kind of research that practitioners are making. It doesn't only have to develop from their own practice. They can also get yeah, inspiration. They have to read up the research literature. They have to feed into each other. So I would certainly say that when we talk about policymakers and what kind of research should they take into consideration, if they only took the practice-oriented research, the local one, that would be a problem. So, so I'm not in favor of that. I would like to see a blended where they are uh, complementing each other in a way. Uh, uh, but uh, having said that, uh, I, I think I would also say that, that um, we have to strengthen the quality of the practitioner's research in many ways. And that means they have to lift it from their own context and beyond. They have to relate it to wider educational problems, to wider educational issues which are being discussed, and not only look at their local school or their local teacher education institution, and this is what we are doing, and this is what we would like to do. If it isn't relevant, I think, also for an external community who can use it, then I think uh, it is not good enough to say it bluntly. So that is also a criteria that I would like to add to this kind of research. It has to be lifted into the general discussion level and not kept at the local level. Was that an answer? <laughs> Time for one more, two more. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm a, uh, one of the professionals within a profession you're talking about. Um, I'm a New Zealander, um, and I'm here early presenting some of my action research. Um, I'm a, a master's level um, teacher. I'm a head of science and um, physics. And I suppose my point is, um, I think it's really critical that teachers experience research as part of their development to become consumers of research. I mean, th the action research I do is of a different nature than the um, new knowledge to society that um, professional researchers produce. But I think you're hitting the, the nail right on the head when you say that for me to understand what your profession is talking about and to use it in my practice and to ch for my profession to change and develop, we need support the same way I support my um, young students becoming young scientists. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the mechanisms are very much the same. I suppose that's just an observation. Um, my question is, given that the social structures currently do not support um, the time, the resourcing, um, the current practice amongst most of my colleagues is not as teacher researchers, what's going to have to happen to to require the profession to develop? What type of stimulus is going to be required on, on a social level um, so that the divisions you showed, showed us on the screen, the small instances, become normalised in our, in our societies? So that's my question. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I don't uh, they say that they will be the norm, become the norm. I think that is a vision that, uh, that would be in the rhetoric. <laughs> uh, but I think that uh, to strengthen the dialogue with those who have the resources, first of all, because I think that uh, that has to be changed. And now we are talking policymakers mainly, but also school principals, I think. That means they have, to, they have to have a view on the teaching profession, which is not only being in the classroom instructing. The view is, of the teaching profession is also, and that should be part of their job description. Uh, we have to have a strong dialogue with, with, with policy, uh, policy makers in doing this. And I don't know, my impression from New Zealand is that there is a strong dialogue between policymakers, researchers, and practitioners. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm seeing it from the outside. <laughs> but on the other hand, I think that some of these projects, that the initiatives that I talked about in Norway, these research council projects, that I cannot apply for funding for a research and development project unless I engage schools or the practice field or the users of this knowledge. I have to engage them. I have to name them. I just can't say who they are, etc. So that is one way of using a top-down approach in order to implementing this thing. Okay. <laughs> This would have to be the last data right. sessions coming thank, on. Right? Thank you for your talk. My name is Xavier Funtic. I come from the Autonomous University in Barcelona. And I just wanted to comment a small, small thing and then ask a question. In Spain, there is a massive concern about all these things, these ideas that you have presented about uh, practitioners as researchers. And in the area of Barcelona, for the last, say, 10 years, uh, there has been a program implemented which is compulsory for all teachers that teach at, uh, at uh, high school, post-secondary school, before university, it's two years, where they have to actually be supervisors of a research conducted by uh, students themselves. Um, this has been much celebrated, but also raises many questions because obviously they are like engaged in the role of supervisors before actually maybe having real experience in research. So, but uh, at the same time, it has been celebrated because it um, is a way of showing that um, students themselves can be producers of, of knowledge somehow. So I, the question is just a general question. What do you, what do you feel, how, uh, what do you think about uh, how to, how to um, um, enhance the, the, the role of um, practitioners as researchers uh, at secondary school, for instance? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think, first of all, they have to learn how, how to become, if they not already are, to become research literate. They have to learn how to be research competent. If you're going to research, uh, to supervise a research project, you have to know how to do it. So I would say that that is the basic part of it. Uh, it, it, it to have courses in methodology, etc., for these people. And uh, um, I think it is possible. That means in the mental education I've been involved with, we are doing this. Uh, uh, they do have research as part of the curriculum. And, 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 and I think that uh, that is a way of starting, at least. I think so. I think we have to stop. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Kari, for a so inspiring presentation. And thank you, audience, for so active discussions. Let's go and enjoy the coffee break.